Engineering is a massively creative thing. In Formula One, the obvious solution isn't usually the right one. Having an artistic background has really helped me to look at problems backwards. Every time I've set myself a goal, I then look at how can I get there quicker? If they're not gonna change it from up there, we can change it from down here. So, Bella Shepherd, welcome. This is a long time coming for me. <laughs> I've, as you know, wanted you on here for a while because I think you have a really cool story to tell. I think you speak incredibly eloquently and uh, I'm already kind of a big fan. Why don't <laughs> you introduce yourself to everyone a little about who you are what you do yeah okay so I'm Bella I'm currently an aero design intern at Williams Racing I've done about six months so far I've got six months left and then I'll go back to uni for a year uni wise I study at UCL in London I do pure mechanical engineering and I've done two years already and then outside of work in uni I do quite a lot with girls on track and I work quite heavily to promote getting younger girls and just younger people in general into engineering. I try and work so that younger people see engineering equally, no matter whether they're a girl or a boy or whatever in between, so that then moving forward, we have a more representative balance of girls and boys in engineering and a greater representation of everyone in general. I think it's actually really good for you to elaborate on your wider hobbies because I think something that I really learned from you is that when people hear someone's in mechanical engineering, I think they think a certain thing about what skills allow you to do that. And I'd really like for you to talk about your whole other but very interlinked creative side. Yeah, I agree a lot of people when they think of mechanical engineering and just engineers in general, they see the people that are very mathematically minded and, you know, science minded, STEM minded. And of, of course, that's a massive part of it. That goes without saying you need that side of it to be an engineer. However, engineering is a massively creative thing. So I remember initially when, when we first spoke, you pointed out that my CV was quite varied. You know, that there was, I've done acting jobs in the past. I love art. I love drama. I love music. And that isn't detracting from the engineering side of it. It's not detracting from my skills as an engineer or as a motorsport engineer. I personally feel like they really add to it because engineering in general is one of those professions where you need to be creative. You need to have lots of sort of spatial awareness and ability to think around the problem and not just look at what's in front of you and go with the obvious solution, because especially in, in things like Formula One, the obvious solution isn't usually the right one or maybe the lightest one or the most innovative one or the most user-friendly one. So having an artistic background has really helped me to look at problems almost backwards, start from what it needs to be at the end of its life cycle and work backwards and then put in whatever I need to along the way and then also I think the drama side of it has been really helpful for me as a person in terms of confidence and kind of presenting myself to new people to other people in interviews or if I'm putting across an idea and it seems a bit weird to begin with having that kind of ability that I've picked up to express myself coherently and confidently has really kind of worked in my favor. I think that's a really interesting one because when we last spoke, you were saying that when you used to think about, oh, like engineering, you just wouldn't think about all these pieces of creativity and what kind of skills are required. What would be really cool to discuss is how you went from, okay, understanding that you were good in certain things and being good at drama and having all these kind of different passions, which on paper didn't link. And then being like, oh, I actually think I want to work in F1. Like, how did that happen? And then how did you make it happen that you are now doing a very, very cool internship? Initially, it really didn't jump out. As you said, like, I, I thought of engineering when I was younger and I'd think, that sounds so boring. <laughs> you know, I really just didn't get that it was such a massive scope of different things and that it could go so many different ways. I really did think it was... It was a man with a spanner covered in engine oil. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't an accurate kind of representation of what engineering really is, but it's what we're fed 
when we're younger is what we see. You know, we see like Bob the Builder on TV when we're like, yay, hi. And it doesn't express to us what it truly means to be an engineer. So, yeah, when I was trying to choose my A-levels, that's when everything really came to a head because I was just confused. <laughs> I wanted to choose everything. Like, I know that's <laughs> it's kind of an annoying thing to say, but I really did. I wanted to choose everything. I was one of those people where I looked into doing IB because I thought having the option of doing more subjects would just suit me better. But it, it kind of, it got to a point where I had to either choose creative or STEM to go forward in terms of like a uni course or a foundation year or something like that. And I sat down with my physics teacher at the time and I said to him, I was like, I am so stuck. <laughs> I said, I want to study physics. I want to study chemistry. I want to study maths. I want to do art. I want to do drama. And he he said to me, he was like, most obvious thing for me is that engineering is such a good choice for you and I said but I don't I don't see why and he said well you, you'll use your maths you'll use your physics you'll use your art and I thought oh yeah and then he said and you you love motorsport right and I was like yeah I've, I've always loved motorsport and he said if you're adding in the motorsport side of it that really it kind of brings in everything you're after. You know, it brings in that sort of exciting career. It brings in the element that it's going to be different every day, that you're you're doing something that's it's it's so new to everyone every time it comes on the TV, every time a race is on. And it uses all the skills that you're wanting to use. Um, and he sort of laid it out and I thought, yeah, like that makes so much sense. And it was like, I know I know it's a silly phrase, but it was like a light bulb moment where I thought, yeah, <laughs> like motorsport engineer really works. And so from that point, I chose academic wise to go along the chemistry, maths and physics route for my A-levels. And then I kept up with art and drama on the side just to kind of keep that part of things going. And from there, it's been like stepping stones. So Every time I've set myself a goal, I then look at how can I get there quicker or how can I strengthen my chances of getting to that goal? So as soon as I realized, okay, I want to be a motorsport engineer, I thought, what do I need work experience? So set out there to annoy everyone I possibly could saying, I want work experience. You know, I emailed so many people and I heard nothing back from probably 95% of them. But it happened by chance that I managed to meet someone whose brother was a racing driver and then I got his email and then, you know, time passed, emails got sent back and I went to Spa for work experience with Lanham Racing and I shadowed their engineers for a weekend and that was amazing and it was like it fully confirmed to me that I was going in the right direction. So after that point, I thought, okay, I've got work experience. Now what do I need? I need more sort of, I need a bigger knowledge base of what I want to do. You know, I want to understand the principles more of engineering and of how cars work or even just the, the fundamental things that you need to know to get into engineering as a whole. So I did what's called the engineering education scheme. And that was run through my school. And I was really, really lucky to do that. I worked in a team and we worked with Southern Water. So it, it wasn't a motorsport related thing at all. You know, it was a project where we were looking at wastewater treatment and everything. But what it gave me was experience working with industry professionals. And it gave me experience of looking at a problem and figuring out a solution and iterating along the way as well you know it wasn't just jumping straight away to the first thing it was okay that didn't work now to the next thing and that was amazing for me because it took me and my team to all sorts of different places and you know we, we got to go and present our work to some amazing people on regional platforms national platforms and that was incredible and so that kind of that then was the next stepping stone, if you like. 
and from there it then went uni <laughs> and at uni the natural thing for most people who want to do motorsport would be formula student so I went that way <laughs> and then from there it's kind of been girls on track and like going that way and getting involved with that and then I put everything together realized I had a decently strong application tried to knit together a decent cover letter and managed to get the Williams placement it's so funny because people think you know motorsports and it's a small community and how do you get there and there's no one path and I think that's the thing that speaking to all of you kind of incredible women is it's literally just starting and then the domino effect happens like things keep moving I think maybe it would be interesting to talk a little bit about because you're a woman in STEM right what has that been like I think the whole women in STEM thing starts to become really prevalent, or at least it did, you know, in the areas where I circulated for school and whatever, when I did my A-levels. Because as soon as I started my A-levels, my physics class was, if I remember rightly, I think it was 15 boys and two girls. So, and I think it is quite a common experience to start feeling that difference as soon as you get into physics at like a kind of higher education level and I don't fully understand the reasoning for that it I think it was the more I thought about it the more it annoyed me because I just thought well there's there's no concrete reason as to why I should be less likely to study this subject you know especially when you're looking at something like physics it's looking in a similar depth at the fundamental things that make the world tick to chemistry and biology and yet you don't see that massive gender disparity there um, so the the thought process is started there where I was just thinking I don't I don't know why I don't fit in here and then it, you know what the higher you get up that further education ladder the worse it becomes um <laughs> and I think because it's natural when you don't see people around you that look like you you're less likely to carry on along that path it's it's human nature so people do kind of drop off and go other ways I would say in general it's it is improving but it's not improving at the rate it should be or could be and I think one of the key reasons for that is that there's not a lack of effort there's just a lack of targeted effort and I think there's a there's a lot of schemes and a lot of campaigns and things that target we need to get women in STEM or they'll show the women that are currently there, which is all well and good. However, if it's not, if it's not actively helping the people that are trying to climb the ladder from the bottom, then it's not going to increase the numbers. You know, you can't, or you're going to have a far smaller effect on the numbers of women in STEM if you're targeting people that are already established in their career. However, you know, if you're looking at younger people, the people that are choosing their A-levels, choosing their GCSEs, choosing, choosing their internships, apprenticeships, all that kind of thing, if you're going there and younger, you're going to see real changes. It's down to like classroom packs that you can do with, it's like no, no kind of tools. You don't, you don't need anything expensive or, or fancy. It's down to... I guess presenting these ideas to everyone from every background in a way that doesn't exclude anybody that you're then going to have a diverse group of people coming up through the ranks I guess I mean I'm just thinking about the impact that your that one conversation with your physics teacher had in terms of the direction you ended up taking and all that was was a clarification of misconceptions or a lack yes. of knowledge because teachers play such a fundamental part in that in like opening your mind to what is possible I think 
it's so difficult though to like we have problems innovating within education as it is so I started thinking well what about social media like what about the fact that so many young people are on are on like TikTok Instagram and and like the learning that happens on YouTube you know what I mean like we are in an era where the format of learning is changing and it's like can those can we use that so that's why I kind of took it on myself somewhat to to look into ways that I could help so I mean it's you know the the audience I reach in itself is it's small however it's more than it would have been without that so I kind of I think the the main thing actually that really 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 got me thinking about it was I read one of James Dyson's books and if I remember the title correctly I believe it was called Engineering a Life and he touched on quite heavily the reasoning why he moved his business away from or you know Dyson in itself away from the UK to Singapore and he said that the issue was from the government down you know the issue was top down there was it was the whole system was geared towards pushing everyone away from engineering, let alone women. You know, when there were huge educational changes in the early 2000s, they almost turned the word apprenticeship into a dirty word. You know, it it wasn't seen as a good career pathway. It was seen as men in grubby boiler suits doing work for minimal pay that wasn't skilled. And that is so far from the truth. James Dyson said that in his book, he worked with young kids to show them that it was a pathway for anybody from a really young age. And he saw that the kids that he worked with when they were really, really young, when they got older, like that that group in particular, he saw a far more even split of girls and boys going into engineering and coming to Dyson to work for him specifically. And he said, he then compared that back to places like Singapore where they really encourage innovation and hands-on jobs and apprenticeships and all these kind of innovative startups. And he saw that the split of men to women is not perfect still, but better than it is here in the UK. It was a controversial point in him moving his whole business out there but his reason for doing so was that the UK government in itself is just so against change in the industry so yeah you know if the government aren't pushing it from their point what can we do if they're not going to change it from up there we can change it from down here and we might as well give it a go. I want to talk a little bit about how it's been at Williams Mm-hmm. What is the stuff that you do or the things you've learned or the experiences you've had that you didn't expect that I think would push other people to be inclined to come in? I mean, first and foremost with that, my internship with, with Williams has been amazing. Like from day one, I get to work with some of the most incredible women and people and engineers you know, there's nobody there that isn't qualified for their job, overqualified for their job. So that, just starting off, I felt good being there. I've found working there, you know, I started off initially quite conservative in how I was expressing myself, just in case, because I didn't know how people were going to perceive me, how liberal the company was. But it only took a few weeks before my hair was pink again. You know, I was wearing my piercings again. We, we're all like, everybody just expresses themselves however they want to. As a woman there, I feel valued. I feel equal. I feel that my voice is heard just as much as my male counterparts. Who inspires you in F1? I think there's a few people that have really influenced me and there's a few people that I look up to that help me keep my drive. I can think of three 
in particular. One is, you know, from F1 past, Sid Watkins, and he was, he was, you know, one of the, the medics. And he was massive for implementing change, you know, positive change. He, he made the sport infinitely safer. He cared about the drivers. He cared about the sport. He cared about, the, you know, the spectators. And he drives me kind of in the background of things. If I think about how he changed everything just by standing up for what he knew was right, that keeps me going in terms of, well, in a lot of ways, I guess, in as a woman in motorsport, but also just as an engineer in motorsport and as a person. So thinking about how he would have done things is quite a big thing for me. There's also the second person is the stereotypical answer, Adrian Newey. <laughs> also, again, goes without saying, and that's, I think I I don't idolise him necessarily because I, I think that word puts people on a pedestal and that's not fair on anyone. But, you know, it, I tend, I, I'm inspired by him because he didn't come from the traditional motorsport background. He came from, like, a really artistic background as well. He's not the strongest with maths. I'm not the strongest with maths. So I see him as, like, if he can get there, with a similar skill set to me, or at least a skill set that has the same kind of tick boxes, if you like, then I can do the same. And then the third is one that less people would have heard of, but more people should, would be Charlotte Phelps. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've met Charlotte once and have just followed her ever since because she is such a powerhouse. <laughs> she she's so important for for women in motorsport at the moment because she you know she's worked with w series and she does other racing series on the side and she is just very unapologetically her you know i relate to her on a pink hair level and i love that but also i i just see in her the sort of person and engineer and role model that I want to be you know when I get to that that level in my career I just I really I really look up to her Charlotte Phelps is a name that keeps coming up <laughs> yeah and if she's listening or if she sees this please come on and tell <laughs> people because you are the third person that I like in ways look up to that has said that you look up to her and I know who she is before anyone mentioned it but now I just want her more and it's it's so interesting because you're starting to see everyday role models and it's mm -hmm. really cool because I think Bella like 10 20 years ago like I'm not sure you would have had another woman to look up to Pete McFerrin from McLaren Applied she said you can't be what you can't see and so when you see someone just like going for it you're like okay she did it I can do this like you yeah. feel more legitimate in being yourself yeah it's it's been through meeting people like Charlotte that's really inspired me to push on further yeah it's having real conversations with real people about the struggles that they had you know the triumphs they've had it it strengthens you because you feel like there's there's strength in numbers there. You know, it's not a completely untrodden path. It's one that people have been down and succeeded at. And yeah, I'm sure all of us would love to say, I did something that no one else has done before. But that's not necessarily what we need to be striving for. It's fantastic if that's what you can manage. You know, I there, there's so much strength in that. However, there are what 8 billion people on the planet and if you're looking at a planet of 8 billion people and absorbing media every day of people 
doing all of these different things, but you're not seeing someone that looks like you that's doing what you want to do. That makes it feel so much harder. You know, that makes it feel so much more daunting. And that mental side of it is really hard sometimes. Is there anything else that you think is important to just whatever you think is an important message? I think the most important thing when you're trying to get into motorsport or even just STEM in general or any side of engineering is to try and surround yourself with people who are working towards a common goal. And to an extent, I think that's what we're doing here. You know, us chatting to each other and having this conversation is us surrounding ourselves with people who are who are like-minded, but who are also helping us to challenge the world and what we're looking at and the way we see it. So if if you're looking to get into motorsport, because that's obviously, you know, the area I can speak for personally, I would say join communities these there are incredible communities like girls on track you know there are pages like fem speed and and girls on pole and all of these different communities that are they were built separately but they're coming together like one big mesh and what that mesh is allowing is the transfer of information and the transfer of inspiration between a network of women, like-minded individuals. And it's through that that you can find some really incredible contacts. And, you know, we've said a a lot of the difficulty of getting into motorsport is having that first stepping stone in. It's that first contact. And if you're part of these communities, those contacts are already there. You know, you don't, it's it's one thing I found you don't need to have 50 contacts already to be allowed to message people within the Girls on Track community specifically. You know, everyone wants to help everyone and you don't need to have some kind of a name already to do that. So the community aspect of getting into it is something that absolutely cannot be understated. And I think it's in campaigns like this one with women talking about their lives and their roles and their pathways that we're building those communities and meshing more together bringing more in making it wider and then the wider those communities get the wider the effect becomes the more hits that's going to get on twitter or linkedin or instagram or facebook it's like an exponential positive It's power in numbers. You were saying before, you were like, you know, I do my bits and pieces and, you know, I have have an effect. I have a small effect, but it's more than there was yesterday. And I think that's the thing. This isn't a problem one person or one group can change. This is the power of collaboration is key. Bella, you are brilliant. And that's not because we share the same name. (laughs) (laughs) It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you for the second time. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for letting me sort of share how I've got to where I am and talk about you know furthering that beyond because it's always a continuous conversation isn't it so thank you for allowing me to be part of part of that (laughs) 